Good morning, and welcome to All Things Marcellus with me, Attorney Doug Clark of the Clark Law Firm. I am located at 1563 Main Street in Peckville, and I'm here every Sunday from 8 to 9 a.m. on these stations to bring you, the landowner, valuable information that you need regarding natural gas development here in Pennsylvania. At the Clark Law Firm, I focus solely on landowner and oil and gas right owner representation. I do not, have not, and will not represent oil and gas companies, pipeline companies, or industry energy companies. Uh, At the Clark Law Firm, I represent clients for oil and gas leases, pipeline agreements, royalty and royalty dispute and deduction issues, uh, estate planning, doing more of that, Also, uh, gas lease amendment modifications, where the company wants to amend, modify, or extend your existing gas lease. And we're also starting to see, I'm going to talk about this some today, where companies are looking to amend, alter, extend, or enter into new pipeline right-of-way agreements after an agreement has already been executed and in place. And I'm going to talk about that some today as well. Also, Uh, Well pads, Uh, if you're going to be getting a well pad or any surface uh, facility, often those are called surface use agreements, well pad agreements, work on those all the time, uh, as well as meter site, compressor station, uh, essentially any and all agreements or other matters related to oil and gas natural, or excuse me, oil and natural gas development here in PA. Uh, If you need representation, you can always contact my office directly at 570-307. 0702. That's 570-307-0702. And also, whether you need uh, representation or if you're looking for what I consider to be high quality information, you can go to my website at pagasleaseattorney.com. That's pagasleaseattorney.com. You can also go to pipelineattorney.com. You have two websites out there. Obviously, the uh, Pipeline website is really dedicated more to pipeline issues, uh, where the PAGasleaseAttorney.com website is uh, dedicated to all gas development and, of course, uh, pipeline issues as well. So check out PAGasleaseAttorney.com, PipelineAttorney.com. Also, what we're doing, what we do is, uh, I've been doing the show now for, boy, I guess we're about uh, around five and a half years at this point. So. Uh, We archive prior radio shows, so if you miss today's show or you listen to today's show, you say, hey, that sounds pretty good. I want to check. I wish I heard other shows. You can go to the websites. We have them archived there and available uh, for the last around a year or so, I think. I'd have to check to get the exact number, but we don't want to keep them all up there because information gets stale. Uh, you know, what happened and what's relevant uh, two years ago, three, four, five, may not be the same situation, same market conditions that we have today. So we have uh, many, many hours of the radio show available if you go to pagasleaseattorney.com and also through pipelineattorney.com. And of course, you can also, if you hear anything today and you want to, you wish, uh, or maybe you didn't quite understand it, we will have today's show. Uh, it'll be up and available tomorrow, Monday. Uh, you can go again to pagasleaseattorney.com. Uh, before I get into the show too much here today, I want to say one thing. Uh, these FERC, which are the which stands is F E R C, which stands for Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. That's Federal Energy Regulatory Commission FERC. Uh, there are many projects that are going on in Pennsylvania where they're pipeline projects, and when they are interstate projects meaning where the pipelines are going to travel from one state cross the border into another state, those pipelines are regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And so what happens there is, is the pipeline company will submit an application to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And what ultimately, and this is a very abbreviated version here, but what happens is they submit this application, they submit all their plans, and they seek approval from FERC. And once they get approval, which they usually, well, when I say usually, almost always do, 
Then they do obtain the power of eminent domain and uh, condemnation proceedings. So in other words, uh, they do their application to FERC. There's this process that goes through. And if it's approved, which again, it usually and almost always is, then the company has the power of eminent domain. So they can go into court uh, and say, okay, well, we're filing this action and we're going to condemn or take this easement area and they do or they are required to pay just compensation to the landowner but the bottom line is is the landowner unless there's very unique circumstances and i mean very unique cannot stop it that property is going to be taken so what landowners need to do in my opinion is make sure that you're talking to somebody as soon as possible an attorney who can assist you get a plan together, work with you to say, how are we going to address this? And what happens is you receive something in the mail, you uh, have somebody show up at the door, one of the landmen, and you find out that your property is in the path of one of these proposed FERC pipeline routes. And what you need to do, you need to get some help. You need to get some information uh, as soon as possible, in my opinion, get a plan together and say, okay, Uh, What am I going to do about this? How do I address this? Also, we have these FERC projects are in various stages, meaning sometimes maybe uh, the application was filed a couple months ago. Uh, In some cases, maybe the application was filed about nine months ago or so. And looking at one example is the Atlantic Sunrise project involving Williams. I think it was March 31st uh, where the application was officially filed with FERC. So, you know, we're getting close on that project, meaning that uh, the approval, if it's approved, which we would think it would be, is probably, and I can't stress this enough because I'm not trying to predict the future, but probably uh, not that far away. Um, So, very important, if you're on the Atlantic Sunrise project uh, as a landowner and that path, you're in the path of that project, I would highly recommend that you consult with an attorney as soon as possible because there are windows, I believe, again, I believe, not specific advice for anyone, but I believe there are windows of opportunity uh, throughout this process and you need to be careful because if you wait too long and you misplay the hand that you have, you can end up regretting that significantly. It's better to be informed, get information, get a plan together, and have a strategy in place and implement that strategy to do the best you can for your situation. Do not wait till the last minute. So you can always contact me again, whether it's me or somebody else. You hear me say that often, and I do mean it. Uh, You can always contact me at 570-307-0702. Again, 570-307-0702. Or some other attorney that's going to work for you and help you and has experience and understands these things and could give you a nice plan. You're listening to All Things Marcellus with me, attorney Doug Clark of the Clark Law Firm, here every Sunday from 8 to 9 a.m. And I was talking about these FERC interstate pipelines. And it's important to understand that there is a big difference between an interstate pipeline project and a regular gathering type of pipeline project. What do I mean by that? Well, I said earlier, these FERC projects are regulated, and the reason why I'm calling them FERC projects is because they are regulated by FERC, again, which is, stands for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, because the pipelines are going from one state to another state. Gathering projects, gathering pipeline projects, where a gas company or pipeline company is gathering gas through pipeline system from wells in Pennsylvania and transporting that gas to interstate pipelines within Pennsylvania, those pipelines are not, I repeat, not regulated by FERC. So in those projects, as a general rule, now, again, general rule, the company does not and cannot get eminent domain authority. So, super critical to identify the type of project that's involved that's impacting your property 
Is it a project where a company may have the ability to obtain eminent domain and condemnation? If they do, believe me, that's not the end of it. Do not simply say, oh, well, uh, the company can get eminent domain. I'm stuck anyway, anyway. Where do I sign? I would highly recommend that you don't do that. I would recommend that you consult with a knowledgeable attorney with experience in these types of cases because in every say this in every FERC project that I've ever worked on, I believe uh, our clients have obtained higher compensation than what was offered and also obtained additional terms or language to be added to that agreement to make it a better, more landowner friendly agreement. So it's not the end of the world. It's not great. You know, you don't want to have, in my opinion, my opinion, you don't want to have the company knock on your door and say, hey, uh, we're going to put this interstate pipeline in and your property is in the path. Generally speaking, most people aren't happy about that. But at that point, you say, okay, well, what am I going to do? Not happy about it. How do I make the best of it? Get yourself a good attorney who can assist you, get you a plan. And what I do a lot of times, you've heard me say before, with these FERT projects, we usually start with an initial consultation and review where we look at your situation, look at who the company is, what's offered, uh, give you the background, what I've seen with this company, the types of offers that I've seen, and we work on developing a strategy to put in place for you, the landowner, answer your questions and concerns. You know, the number one thing, whether it be pipelines, gas leases, royalties, you know, whatever it is, my experience has been the number one issue and problem facing landowners is lack of good quality information from the landowner's side. You know, we need you as the landowner to get and you need good quality information to allow you to make the best decision in your situation. And that's a big problem. You know, there's not, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, I do the show and I enjoy doing is to try to get this information, make people think, uh, get you, you know, to say, okay, well, this is, all right, well, this is my type of situation. What do I do about it? Well, or, hey, you know what? I think I heard that guy on the radio talk about this. Um, maybe I'm going to go back to his website and go back and listen to that radio show and get a plan together. Uh, you know, that's what you need to do. Good quality information. You cannot, you cannot rely on the gas company, pipeline company, landman to provide you good quality information for you on the landowner side. Why? Because here it is coming early because the land man works for the company, not for you. So certainly there's information that the land man is going to tell you that's going to be very valuable to understand the project, what's going on. You know, you get all the information that you can. I'm a very big believer in that. Then you turn and you say, okay, I'm going to know now I'm going to take this information. I'm going to go maybe have a consultation, a review with an attorney, sit down and understand my rights from my side, from someone who's working for me. You know, very, very important. So these FERC interstate pipelines, there are several projects going on now across the state. And we want to make sure that people are being informed, learning their rights. The earlier, the better but it's never too late. You know, that's a key point. The earlier you learn your rights, the earlier you get a plan together, the better it is for you. However, you're sitting there, you say, well, geez, I was contacted. I'm on the, I'm on the Atlantic sunrise. I've been sitting here and I never called an attorney. I never did anything. And now here we are. Uh, it's been nine months. It's been seven, eight, nine months since they filed. Well, I might as well sign. Listen, it's never too late. Get yourself an attorney, get some good advice, someone that knows what they're doing, and someone that can help you out. If you are interested, and again, I'm sorry, I don't want to make it a commercial, but uh, 570, you can contact our office, Clark Law Firm, 570-307-0702. But if you don't call us, call someone. Do not just simply sign documents. Learn your rights. And 
you know, look, you don't, whether any attorney, you shouldn't have to sign up for something long term. Get yourself an initial review and consultation. Learn your rights. Then, if you want to do something further, then you can. If you don't, you don't have to. But at least do that. Do yourself a favor and do that. You're listening to All Things Marcellus with me, Attorney Doug Clark from the Clark Law Firm. I'm here again every Sunday from 8 to 9 a.m., and I'm going to be right back after this break. Welcome back to All Things Marcellus with me, Attorney Doug Clark of the Clark Law Firm. You know, I just want to go back and touch on, I was going to be done with the FERC and the pipelines, but I just want to touch on again. It, it's so important when you as a landowner are contacted by a landman or a company to sign uh, any agreement, but we'll, we're sticking with pipelines for now. But it's so important with a pipeline agreement that you understand the agreement that you're presented with. You know, people are signing bad agreements because they believe that the company may have the ability by eminent domain or condemnation to install this pipeline even though the landowner doesn't want the pipeline. So you have to understand what it comes down to, and I have a lot of information about this on the websites, but what it comes down to is, is to assess your leverage. What are your options? What I mean by that is, is if you are presented with a pipeline agreement that involves a FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission project going from state to state, well, that evaluation, because eminent domain and condemnation very well may become a part of this process, very well may become, you need to understand that. And then negotiations in this whole process is a different process. Your leverage in those cases are different is different than in other cases that you never have to worry about condemnation, eminent domain. It is different. You have to understand that immediately. That is fundamental. Well, not immediately, but you know, early on, you have to understand that. Now, on the flip side, I mentioned these gathering pipeline projects where the company wants to transport gas from wells to an interstate pipeline that is within your state. Meaning, in other words, you have a major interstate pipeline that goes from, let's say it goes from California to New York. And let's say it's like on Route 80. It travels right across Pennsylvania, east to west. Well, the pipelines that are going to transport the gas from the various well sites to this interstate pipeline, so into, to our Route 80, if you will, those pipelines are virtually never going to be able to get eminent domain status and condemn your property. Again, you got to look at every case uh, individually, but generally speaking, almost never is, go is eminent domain going to come into play there. You have to understand that. So right away, that creates, right away, that's a little pipeline joke, uh, <laughs> immediately, that creates a different uh, evaluation process. Now, so if you're presented with a gathering pipeline agreement, so if you get a gathering agreement and you say, okay, it's not an interstate pipeline, FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, is not involved, I do not have to worry about eminent domain. That's a very nice first step in part of this assessment of leverage. Assessment of leverage is very detailed, very complicated. There are many, many factors. And again, you can go to pagasleaseattorney.com, pipelineattorney.com, things to look at, things to consider. But there are many, many parts of uh, assessing leverage and certainly too many to get into in any radio show. But easy, basic, fundamental stuff here. Understand, is it an interstate pipeline project or is it a gathering pipeline project? The vast majority of right-of-way agreements that are going to be presented to landowners are going to be gathering pipeline projects for gathering pipelines, meaning for pipelines that are going to transport gas from well sites to an interstate pipeline within Pennsylvania, where then that gas is going to be shipped uh, across the country, across the region, to northeastern United States, wherever, but it's going to be transported through the interstate pipeline system. So we have thousands and tens of thousands of miles of gathering pipelines because you can think of it as spider webs 
you know, getting this gas from the various well sites to the main pipelines that are going to be carrying it from state to state. And these interstate pipelines, they'll give you an idea. You know, the interstate pipelines tend to be, you'll see typically 30, 36 inch in diameter. It's pretty big. Gathering pipelines are tend to be maybe six inch, eight inch. Uh, sometimes you'll see some bigger ones. Uh, maybe you might see a 24 uh, 16 inch, but generally speaking, you're going to see, well, they're always going, almost always, virtually always going to be smaller pipelines. So as a landowner, you got to understand and assess what type of project do I have? Then you say, okay, I have a gathering agreement. It's not going to involve eminent domain and condemnation. What's the next step? You're listening to all things Marcellus with me, attorney Doug Clark, Clark Law Firm. We're here every Sunday from 8 to 9 a.m. talking about pipelines. We're talking about uh, a FERC pipeline project where the pipelines are going to go, uh, where the pipeline will go from Pennsylvania into uh, other states. And so we're traveling, uh, the pipeline would travel across Pennsylvania into New York, wherever it may go. But an interstate pipeline is a pipeline that's going to go state to state. The gathering, so what we're saying here, I don't want to go too far back, but the gathering pipeline, so what we're saying is you get a pipeline agreement offer. First step, okay, is this a pipeline agreement that I need to worry about potential eminent domain and condemnation? Chances are it is not, but you need to figure that out. So now you say, okay, pipeline agreement presented to me, it's not an interstate, excuse me, it's not an interstate pipeline agreement. So eminent domain and condemnation is not going to come into play. However, we need to go further, as always. And the next step, the next initial step, and again, this is very broad. This is very kind of uh, above ground overlooking this. This isn't, this is a forest uh, discussion, not a tree discussion here. So the next step is, it's a gathering line. Now what we want to look at, my opinion, what I always want to look at next is, is this pipeline project or is this pipeline easement that's being presented to you, the individual landowner, is this a pipeline that is authorized to be installed under your existing gas lease agreement? Well, if you don't have a gas lease agreement, then certainly that ga there's no gas lease agreement that the company can say, hey, we have the authority to install this pipeline under your gas lease. So I don't even have a gas lease, so that's not relevant. However, many people have gas leases. So, and where pipelines, where companies are seeking to install pipelines. So then you look and you say, okay, I need to know, does, is this pipeline easement is presented for my property? Is it authorized? Is it, is the company, if I don't want to agree, if I say, no, I don't want this, can the company install it anyway? Because my gas lease, which I signed previously, can the company install it under the terms of my gas lease? And that can be very tricky. It's not always as easy as what you may think it to be. Sometimes it is. And what we need to do is we need to really identify this is critical in the assessment of your leverage. We need to identify, is this a pipeline that the company could, if they had to, if you don't want it and you won't reach an agreement with the company, can they install that pipeline anyway? And again, I can't stress enough, that's not always a simple evaluation. And you cannot rely on the gas company landman to be the person who gives you that answer. You can't do that. You need, in, and even if it seems clear, you need to double check this. Also, there's many things beyond this too, because you may say, or the, the reality may be that the initial pipeline that the pipeline company wants to install or the gas company wants to install is actually allowed or authorized under your gas lease. However, so however, but what happens is, so it's authorized. You say, well, company can do it anyway. I might as well just go ahead and sign. However, many times it can be very misleading the way it's presented to you as a landowner where, yes, maybe uh, this pipeline is allowed to be installed 
under your gas lease, but the pipeline that's allowed to be installed under your gas lease may only may only be installed to carry gas from wells which you're receiving royalties. Most leases, in my experience, most leases, even leases that weren't negotiated, most leases that I look at say that the gas company, excuse me, the gas or pipeline company can only put a pipeline on your property if it's going to transport gas from wells in which you're receiving royalties. I want to say that again. Very, very important statement. Please pay attention. I want to try to make sure I say this as clearly as I can. Most gas leases that I review and that I see state that, and again, most, state that a gas or pipeline company has the ability to install a pipeline on your property if that pipeline is going to carry gas from wells which you're receiving royalties. However, however, most of these agreements also, what they do is, is they don't allow a company, a gas or a pipeline company, to install pipelines that are going to transport gas from other wells which you're not receiving royalties from. So what happens is, very common in my experience, company landman says, hey, yeah, we have the ability to do this, to install this pipeline, so you might as well sign, we can do it anyway, and by signing the pipeline right away agreement, you're going to get more money. So might as well sign, hey, we're good guys, we're doing you a favor. We're giving you this pipeline agreement, and we don't even really need to do it. We're paying you $25, $30 a foot, whatever that price may be. We're paying you this, this money, even though we don't have to, because we're good guys. However, the pipeline agreement, if you then go and you sign the pipeline agreement, you say, well, geez, boy, these guys are great guys. What a good deal. So you go ahead and you sign the paper. You say, this is wonderful. Wow. Can, I guess these gas companies are really nice. I don't know why I hear all these other things about them. Well, what can happen is, is that, yeah, maybe, maybe at the beginning that pipeline could be installed because it's going to carry gas from your wells. But what happens is the companies will tie in often other well sites that are going to then transport gas through this pipeline that's now on your property. When in fact, your lease would not allow that. But if you sign a pipeline agreement, well, then the company is going to be not are not going to be restricted so they can transport gas from anywhere in the country or beyond through your property. So you may say, well, you know, OK, well, what do I care? Well, maybe you do, maybe you don't. But here's why you should care early on, because you need to understand and assess your leverage and understand your rights, because maybe and a lot of people do not want to have a pipeline on their property. Generally speaking, uh, you know, I understand that. They do not want to have a pipeline on the property. Or if it's going to be on the property, they certainly want to make sure they get as much money as possible as they can and get the best possible agreement. So what happens is, if you believe that the company has the ability to install the pipeline on your property under the terms of your gas lease, well, your leverage and your assessment of leverage, if the company doesn't have that authority, your assessment is going to be way off and you're going to end up entering into a poor agreement. And you're not going to realize that you actually may have had the right to say, thank you, but no thank you. I'm not interested in this pipeline. I'm going to explain more about this. Stick with this. This is a critical critical point. It's hard to digest sometimes, uh, critical. And I want to get back to this. You're listening to All Things Marcellus with me, attorney Doug Clark of the Clark Law Firm, here every Sunday from 8 to 9, and I'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to All Things Marcellus with me, attorney Doug Clark of the Clark Law Firm. Again, I'm here every Sunday from 8 to 9 on these stations. Also, if you miss any of today's show or 
any show recently. We've been doing I've been doing the show since August of 2010. Go check out PA Gas Lease Attorney.com, Pipeline Attorney.com. We will post today's show. It'll be up and available tomorrow, Monday. So you can go back there, listen to the show again, and you can listen to many other shows uh, that are available up at PA Gas Lease Attorney.com and Pipeline Attorney.com. Also, really encourage you if you've not been to PA Gas Lease Attorney.com or Pipeline Attorney.com, go check it out. You, you can spend a day on there, I believe, and get, you know, look, learn, get good information, whether you need representation or not. I think it's a really good resource for all Pennsylvania landowners. Okay. So, what I was talking about, we're talking about pipelines in a very, like I said earlier, we're looking at this as a forest. We're not diving into the trees, but we're looking at more of a, a wider scope picture here. So, what, what I'm talking about is, um, assessing leverage, which is such an, it's the most critical thing uh, when you're involved with pipelines. So if you're a landowner and you're presented with a pipeline agreement, the, the most important thing for you, in my opinion, is to get the best possible assessment of your leverage. What are your options? What are your rights? What can you do? Can you say no? Do you have the ability to say no? Is eminent domain and condemnation a possible part of this process? Usually it is not. Then the next step is if you have a gathering line agreement, eminent domain, condemnation is not part of this. The next step is do I have the right to say no or would this type of pipeline be allowed to be installed under the terms of my existing gas lease? We have to then go to your gas lease if you have one. If you don't have one, it's easy. There's no right to install the pipeline. But if you don't or if you do have a uh, gas lease, we go to your gas lease. We very carefully look at everything because it's not always as easy as what it seems. And it's very easy for a landman maybe to give an impression that something is allowed when actually maybe it is not allowed under your gas lease or... What I was talking about in the last segment is, well, maybe uh, the pipeline may be allowed because it's going to transport uh, your gas from wells that you're getting royalties from, but maybe it's not allowed the same exact pipeline because it's also going to transport gas from wells that you're not receiving royalties. So... What, when does that really matter? Why is that such a big concern? Well, for you as a landowner, number one, you may be able to just simply say no because you don't want the pipeline to go through your forest, your cropland, close to your house, or for whatever reason on your property. Pipelines, I can, look, pipelines do not increase the value of your property. Pipelines do not increase the value of your property. In fact, it's the opposite. Pipelines will decrease the value of your property. If you had an option of buying a property, 50 acre property, beautiful property that had a pipeline or the other identical 58 piece of property, two lots right beside each other, and the other one doesn't have a pipeline and they're the same price, which one are you going to buy? You're going to buy the one that does not have the pipeline. You can't build on the pipeline. You can't plant trees on the pipeline. You can't have obstructions, water impoundments. There are many limitations. Also, many people are concerned about safety issues related to pipelines. And some people just simply would never buy a property because it had a pipeline on it. So when you enter into a pipeline agreement, you are typically, if it's a pipeline is installed, you're going to get a one-time payment. That's it. So you better be darn sure that you're doing the best you can because you're not going to get a yearly payment. You're not going to get royalties and you're going to devalue your property and you're going to have a pipeline there potentially forever. So you want to be very careful. So when a company comes and they present this agreement to you, you're going to assess, can I say no? And if you can say no, Maybe you just want to right off the bat say, hey, thanks, but no thanks. Well, maybe it is a pipeline that's authorized under your gas lease. Well, again, here's where it gets super tricky because 
many of these, many of these pipeline projects or these uh, pipeline agreements when they're coming to your property and say, hey, we want to put this pipeline in the ground on your property. Well, many times those pipelines are going to carry gas from wells that you're receiving or will receive royalties from, but, but they are also going to carry gas from wells where you're not receiving any royalties, which means that yes, if this pipeline is only going to carry gas from wells in which you're getting royalties, if push comes to shove and you don't sign a document, the company can go ahead and say, hey, we have the right under your gas lease. You don't see that very often, but it can occur. However, if that pipeline is going to carry gas from your wells, but also other wells that you're not getting royalties from, well then, in most cases, you can say no. You can flat out say, no, thank you. I am not interested in this pipeline on my property. And in another alternative, you can say, well, I'm not interested in this pipeline. I'm not interested in this at 20, 25 or $30 a foot. However, however, if you give me uh, $50 or $100 a foot, well, then now maybe I'm starting to be more interested. So assessing the leverage is so critical to understand that, okay, can I say no? And if I can say no, do I just want to say no and no thank you and walk away and end it? Or do I want to say no and or, or say no and negotiate and say, well, I don't want this pipeline, but instead of $25 or $35 or $30 a foot, I'll do it if you give me 50, 60 or $100 a foot, whatever that number may mean or be. Remember, you have the ability in my example to say no. So you can just simply say no. A lot of times companies will say, okay, well, I understand you say no. Uh, is there another Is there another number? Uh, would you agree if we paid you more money? Well, then you can negotiate and try to get higher money. And if you get an agreement, that's great. And you may decide, okay, even though I do not have to agree to this because my lease does not allow this pipeline, I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway because I like the compensation that's being offered, that I think that this is a good deal for me. But every agreement has two parts. You have compensation, how much money, pretty simple. Well, I shouldn't say that. How much money, because sometimes it's, do you get money for a first line, second line, how many lines, something above ground. So you got the money side of it, then you have the language side of it. What is the language in the agreement? What are the addendum terms? How many pipelines can be installed? Where is this pipeline going to be? When am I going to be paid? How long of an option period? How long does the company have to either decide to install the line, to pay me? When are they going to pay me? When does this thing end or terminate? How do I protect myself from potential liability, being sued, uh, being having to defend myself in court if, God forbid, somebody is hurt or killed in the process of construction, a trespasser comes on the property, you need to be protected. How is it going to be reclaimed? How is it going to be receded? What's going to happen with the timber? Like, and people don't think about this too. You know what's going to happen with the stumps, uh, the the un, the non-marketable timber, branches, limbs, things like that. Well, uh, I've seen. I mean, I've sat there. I've seen. I would have really liked as a kid growing up in the country some of these piles of stumps. I mean, just mammoth piles of stumps going through may, or through pipelines uh, where they're going through uh, a lot of woods in a wooded area. I've seen these things piled up, you know, 20 feet plus high. Real fun to climb as a kid, but how long is that going to take to rot away? So you may say, hey, I don't want these stumps. I want them ground up. I want them removed. There are so many things. Where are these big stones? They're digging up big stones. They're going to pile them along this right away. You know, what are they going to do? So there's so much more involved than just money. And two, with money, remember we have, well, how much am I going to get up front when I sign? How much am I going to get when they go ahead and install the pipeline? 
Well, what if they put in a second pipeline? Am I going to get paid for that? Well, you better get paid for that. How much am I going to get paid? Uh, many of those things. Can they have forever to put in a second line? There are many, many aspects to even compensation. Then you turn to the agreement. And as an individual landowner who's doing this for the first, maybe you're doing it for a second time. You know, I, I, like I'm talking about the value of experience and understanding where uh, you know, you're doing this once, you're talking to the company landman, they've done you know hundreds of these, and you have a really good chance that you may be getting taken advantage of. So experience is really valuable. Um, you, know, you learn from experience, and a lot of times, you know, what you learn in learning from, in, in gaining experience, you learn from mistakes maybe that you made or mistakes that other people have made. So you have the opportunity to see where people entered into bad agreements, how those agreements came back to haunt that landowner, and how can we correct those those problems. So if you, in the future, the landowner doesn't run into those same circumstances. All very important, the value of experience. So when you're a landowner and you're trying to negotiate these terms, I've seen many landowner negotiated documents, and I'll be honest, I've seen very few that I would call excellent. There are some out there, but there are very few. So, you know, I've talked to many people, oh, yeah, I did research, I did this, I did that. And we find out later, you know, those agreements that they thought that were really strong have came back to haunt them. So it's really important, like I say, whether it's me or someone else, get somebody with experience. I say often, uh, I've negotiated in pipeline projects with over with about 50, 50 plus separate companies across Pennsylvania. And I say that to give the landowners, to give you the listener and landowners the idea of what's going on, you know, the type of experience that's available out there. Uh, so when you're when you're sitting there and you're saying, oh, okay, you know, I got this, I can I can do this. Remember, uh, it's a, it may be a lot more complicated than you think. So whether it's me or somebody else, please get assistance. Don't go at it alone. Too many people have done that and have made mistakes. You're listening to All Things Marcellus with me, Attorney Doug Clark of the Clark Law Firm. We're heading into the last segment. We're going to wrap this up. I'll be right back after this break. And again, I'm here every Sunday from 8 to 9 a.m. on these stations. Welcome back to All Things Marcellus with me, Attorney Doug Clark of the Clark Law Firm. Again, if you miss any of today's show, you can go back to pagasleaseattorney.com, pipelineattorney.com. Whether you missed the show and you want to go back and listen to it, you want to go back and listen to a bunch of the archive shows we have, or you're just looking for good information, check out pagasleaseattorney.com, pipelineattorney.com. All right. I want to try to like bring all this back together again. And the most important thing is, look, the radio show is always about trying to get information to you, the landowner. We want to make sure that you're getting information, that you're thinking about things, that you know, hopefully you're opening your mind and realizing that there are things that these companies can do that maybe you hadn't thought about. So, you know, I, I can't stress enough that this is only a primer if you will, the most bare bones, basic things, the fundamental things that you should be looking at and trying to understand, but leverage assessment for whether it be gas lease, pipeline, we're talking about pipelines today, uh, well pad agreements, all of these things, leverage assessment is the key. And what do I mean by that? What is your leverage as the landowner? You know, you're, you're going to, it's like, you know, it's like almost like if you're playing poker, uh, you need to look at your hand to see how good it is. You know, what hand do you have in this poker game? What hand do you have in these negotiations? Are you sitting there and you have essentially very little rights? In which case, then we say, okay, well, what do we do to make the best of this? Or do you have the ability to say no to this proposal entirely? Or do you, and do you, if you want, don't want to say no, or if you do want to say no, is there a financial compensation offer that would work for you. So if they're offering you $50,000 for a pipeline and you really don't want it, but hey, if they offered you a quarter million dollars, then hey, yeah, maybe this becomes a lot more attractive and you have the right to say no. You can simply say, hey company, I don't want this pipeline. Thank you, but no thank you. Uh, I know you're offering me 50000 I really don't want it, but if you were willing to offer me 250000 maybe it's 150, whatever your number is, then I'm willing to talk to you. That can be a very 
effective strategy. So think about that. So in a circle back, we're talking about the leverage assessment on these gathering lines and a critical part and I cannot possibly get into uh, all of the different um, nuances of this, but I want to talk about when you have an existing gas lease, you need to understand, is this proposal allowed, authorized, or permitted under your existing gas lease? Does the company have the right to install the pipeline? I'm telling you, it happens all the time. I talk to pipeline managers at companies, at the pipeline company, not the landman, not the landman service company, but the pipeline companies who have told me, oh yeah, we have the ability to put this in under the gas lease. So we say, all right, well, how about this then? Why don't you guys just go ahead and do that? Uh, well, uh, well, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we want to do a, a pipeline agreement. Well, why do they want to do an agreement in most cases like that? Because although maybe they can put in a pipeline under your lease, if they do that, that pipeline can only transport gas from your wells that you're getting royalties from. And the reality is what they don't tell you is, yeah, maybe they have the right to do that, but they also want to transport gas from other wells all across your region and they do not in many cases in most cases that i see have the right to do that so the company land man understandably this is like one of these um half truth scenarios where yeah you know it's true but they're not telling you something uh that's extremely important so, yeah, maybe it's true that they can put a pipeline in, but the pipeline that they want to put in, they want to transport gas from all over your region or from other wells that you're not participating in, and they absolutely do not, do not have the right to do that in many cases. So they dupe or trick the landowner by saying, oh, yeah, you know, this is going to transport gas from your wells. We can do it under the terms of your lease. But they don't tell you that it's also going to transport gas from other wells that you're not getting royalties from. And that's not allowed under your lease. So then in that scenario, you as a landowner can say, hey, thanks, but no thanks. I do not want this pipeline. I don't want to devalue my property. I don't like where you want to put it. I don't want it to separate my trees. I don't want to lose all these trees. I'm concerned about how you're going to reclaim this property. I'm concerned about potential future liability. I have all of these different concerns. So you know what? I'm not interested. Maybe your concern is safety. I am not interested. Or you say, you know what? I have the right to say no to this. You're offering me $25 a foot. Uh, it's just not enough. You know, I, I don't need this. I can say no, but if you give me $50, $60, whatever that number is, some higher number, if you give me higher compensation, then I'm willing to go ahead and do this. So you can negotiate that compensation. I'm attorney Doug Clark. This is all things Marcellus. I'm here every Sunday from eight to 9 AM. And we're talking about pipelines and the critical part here. Again, you can say, in this scenario, you can say no. You have to understand your right to say no. And because you can say no, you have now greater leverage to negotiate. Greater leverage to negotiate compensation and or, and both, you have greater leverage to negotiate terms, language in the agreement. Can anything be above ground in the pipeline easement area? Can there be a roadway installed across my property to the pipeline easement? Can there be a second or third line installed? Do you company need a 50 or 75 or 100 foot easement? Can you, uh, you can, you can seek to negotiate and you can always negotiate. Uh, it depends on what the outcome ultimately is, but you can always seek to negotiate. How wide is the permanent easement going to be? How wide, how much can they clear in general? All of those things are negotiable. Well, how are you going to negotiate? And is, you know, back to my earlier analogy, how are you going to play poker if you don't look at your hand? If you don't see what your cards are, how are you going to play? So how are you going to be effective? You can play, but how are you going to be effective? 
So with the pipeline agreement, if you don't know your hand, if you don't know the cards that you have, if you don't know what your options are and you don't know what your leverage is, how are you going to effectively handle this situation? How are you going to get the most money? How are you going to get the best terms? And in fact, though, another option is, you know, you if you don't know, you could have declined. You could have simply said, hey, I don't want this pipeline agreement and moved on. But if you didn't understand your leverage, you would have never been aware of that. You have to understand these points. And it's not, it's not a difficult thing if you have the experience. But I'm telling you, it is very tricky and it can be very difficult when you as a landowner, you're looking at this lease and there's a lot of complicated language in the gas leases. Often the addendum language can be much more clear. You may see a term that says, hey, uh, you cannot transport third party or foreign gas across my property. That's what it says in the gas lease. So then that means that from other properties that they can't transport gas if you're not getting royalties from those wells, that gas can't come across your property. But again, can't stress it enough, it's very easy, in my opinion, for a landman to kind of twist that around to make landowners believe that it's that the pipeline is allowed under the gas lease, even under these foreign um, clauses, even under these addendums that say no foreign gas. It's very simple, I think. In many cases for landmen, I say, hey, yeah, we're not going to do that now, but then later on, after you signed a pipeline agreement, foreign gas starts flowing through. So you have to understand how do I identify this? How do I handle this? And I can tell you the best way is to talk to somebody with a lot of knowledge and experience working for you, not the company landman. I am attorney Doug Clark. You're listening to all things Marcellus. Again, I'm here every Sunday from 8 to 9 a.m. I'll be back next week. Have a great week, everyone.